yeah, why are you here? You know, I, I know that some of you, because you already came up and said to me that, like, you've just been so excited to be here, and this is like the highlight of your year, and that's just phenomenal. And then there's another few people that are like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> amen? Okay, those of you who are first-timers here, when I say amen, you respond, amen, amen? <laughs> it's not that complicated. I do that to keep you awake. Amen? So it's not bad. So some of you come here and it's like your bucket list. Who, who is like your bucket list is to come to a conference at Franciscan University? Amen. Oh, it's mine. It's mine. All right. So I was just thinking about that, this, this sense of bucket lists. When my younger brother and I, Tom, uh, we were younger, we had this, this whole plan that, that we were going to live together and, and then our, we'd get married and our spouses would all live together and... <laughs> But one of the things we always talked about was going skydiving. We just thought that it would be cool to go skydiving, kind of a bucket list thing. I remember I was in seminary, and my brother calls me, and he goes, Dave, uh, I just went skydiving. I said, like, I thought, I thought we were going to do that together. Like, what kind of brother are you? You go off and you get married, and I thought we were going to do that together. And, <laughs> and now you decide to go skydiving. And my mom must have heard about this because my mom calls me a couple of days later, and the new catechism had just come out. And she goes, uh, I was actually, I was talking about Tom and going skydiving, and I was frustrated. And, and my mom says, Dave, you know it's a mortal sin to go skydiving. So, <laughs> like, who's in seminary, mom? Is that you or me, right? I said, it's just not. She goes, no, it's in the new catechism. Have you seen the new catechism? Yeah, I've seen it. She goes, it's a mortal sin. I said, mom, you don't want me to go skydiving. Please don't. don't go skydiving. So I didn't for a while. <laughs> so I'm back here at the university, fairly newly ordained, um, awfully young and foolish. Um, and I remember I was preaching at Christ the King, and it was mass, and it was one of my favorite texts of the scriptures is the Canticle of Simeon, where he says, now, Lord, you may dismiss your servant in peace, for I've seen just a beautiful, beautiful text. I was preaching about that, and I said to the, to the students, I said, you know, what's that thing that, that you want to be able to do? And once you do it, you can say, now, Lord, you may dismiss your servant in peace. Well, this one student, she raises her hand, I said, yeah, what is it? And she goes, I want to go skydiving. And I said, so do I. <laughs> so literally in the middle of mass, it's like, okay, let's make a deal. So this is what we're going to do. All right. So I invited a bunch of students to go skydiving. It was myself and nine girls. Really, seriously, no guys would go. It's like, you bunch of babies. That right there is what's wrong with this country, all right? So, so myself and nine girls, we go up to a place. We didn't think this through. The name of the place was Rick's Skydiving, right? Like this person in with crutches walks out and says, you know, you want to do that. So it's, it's crazy. How many people, just for the record, have gone skydiving before? Okay, just so you know, that's a free time activity tomorrow, so... Uh, and if you wouldn't mind for your life insurance to sign that over to the university, we'd greatly appreciate that, right? Here's the thing, though. If you're going to go skydiving, you sign like 50 documents saying, I will not sue you, right? If anything goes bad, the first one's just kind of like, nothing ever bad happens. In fact, they give you this one statistic. More people die driving to go skydiving than actually die diving while skydiving. It's like, oh, that's comforting. All right, so that's at the beginning, right? Nothing's going to happen. But each time... It, each sheet, you literally four different times as you're getting closer and closer to the plane, you have to sign these things. It's like nothing bad's going to happen. And then it's like, well, something could happen. You know, the plane goes. And then the last one, it's you're probably going to die. Just don't blame us, right? <laughs> so there were a couple of things that went through. I, I remember the guy who was teaching us, I guess. Uh, one of the lines he said, it was, it's important. He says, uh, uh, fear is temporary, regret is forever. Yeah. Fear is temporary. Regret is forever. He said, if you go up and you chicken out your whole life, you're just going to regret that, right? This, and there's something to that. There's some, not necessarily what I don't want to talk about, but there's something to that sense of regret, right? That I wished I would have, or, or perhaps I wish I wouldn't have. But fear is temporary. Regret is forever. The other thing that they said is you are paying to go for a ride in a plane. You are not paying to go skydiving. So their point was, if you go up and you don't jump, you're not getting your money back, right? 
right? So we decided, I decided I wanted to go uh, tandem, which allows you to free fall. So the scariest part of this whole thing was actually the plane. It was this little plane that held uh, five people. So the pilot, myself, the person I was jumping with, one of the students, and the person she was jumping with. So if you've not done it before, um, you've got this little, you've got the parachute, you've got somebody behind you, they've got the parachute on them, they let you. So they go through this whole thing about what it's going to look like and how it's going to happen. And right before we get on the plane, I said, uh, I would love to do a somersault. And they said, what? And I said, I think it'd just be cool if I'm going to do this, might as well do this, right, and do a somersault. And he said, are you serious? I said, absolutely. He said, okay, forget everything that we just said, all right? <laughs> I didn't remember it anyway, right? So, so they say, so when you jump, what you need to do is you need to jump and you just move your head, like push your head to your butt as hard as you can, and then you'll start to spin, and then we'll take care of it. So, um, so, so I'm standing. So you, you, you kind of get up in the plane and you just kind of like shuttle because you're connected to this guy. Please, Lord, let me be connected to this guy, right? <laughs> So, so, like, it is something else. Uh, again, if you skydived, you know that. But when you sit and you look there, and it's like 13,000 feet. <laughs> Do you know what imperfect contrition is? <laughs> this is imperfect contrition, right? This is contrition that says, if I die, forgive me of my sins. Perfect contrition is out of love. Imperfect contrition is looking down 13,000 feet that says, Lord, if I die, forgive me of all my sins. Right? <laughs> that first, like that jump is just, and then it was fantastic. It was exhilarating. The funny thing is, is I literally, I was done I landing and my father called me. My dad didn't call me very often. And he said, so where are you? And I decided that I wasn't going to tell them because I thought it'd be a good idea. One of the things I did, and I looked for the video, but I couldn't find it, is I videoed this whole thing. And the first thing I said in the video is, mom, dad, you're going to be seeing this one way or the other. I'm a realist, folks. I said, and I said, I really hope I'm sitting next to you watching this. I'm awful. I'm awful. I'm awful. That first step. The Lord is inviting each of us to jump tonight. Or, or to make a step. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is, what does that look like? Because the reality is, is it looks different for everybody here. What, it, what is it going to look like for you to, to jump into the weekend, to jump in tonight? What is it going to look like for you to make this step, as Ralph was saying tonight, this step of faith? This, this step that the next step, you're not positive what it's going to happen or what it's going to look like, but the sense that God wants you to make some step. And, and I think that the Lord has, and, and this is why I, I began with, we're all coming in from different places, but I think the Lord wants each one of us to make some kind of a step this weekend. I don't, I don't think he wants us to stay, I don't think he wants you to stay where you are. This is one of the beautiful things about our faith is, is the Lord is continually inviting us to something new, to something different. And the reality is, for some people, that's really frightening. Because we have this area that we call faith, and it's comfortable, and it's familiar, and we know how God works, and we never want to get outside of that. But I want to suggest that maybe this weekend, the Lord is, in fact, inviting you to take a step outside of that. And what does that look like? We're going to take a look at two characters in the scriptures that were invited to make steps of faith. The first one comes from the 10th chapter of Mark. Jesus is in Jericho. Uh, anyone been to Jericho, if you have? Let's do this in Jericho next year, all right? As he was setting out on the journey, a man runs up, ran up, and knelt down before Jesus and asked him. Okay, so just for a second, imagine this scene. Jesus is, he's been in Jericho for a couple of days. It's time for him to leave, and this guy, like, books up. Scripture says he runs up, 
And he kneels down before him. That's something quite beautiful, right? So that he understands that there's something about Jesus, but he's also, there's a sense of urgency. Jesus is on his way out. This guy, I, I just imagine he was wrestling with this. It's like, I'd love to talk to that guy. Ah, I don't know. And then as scripture says, Jesus is ready to leave. So he's like, okay, I've got to talk to him. So he runs up, scripture says, he runs up and he kneels down before him and asks him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? As a side note, if you can't answer that question, we have a problem. There are a few questions that are absolutely essential that everybody has the answer to. You need to be able to answer that question. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? But as I was praying over this, I was wrestling with this because any good Jew would know what they have to do to inherit eternal life. I mean, why is he asking this question? I mean, there's, there are some that are complicated questions, and as priests, we get complicated questions all the time. It's like, my aunt told me, it's like, I don't know. It's amazing how much I don't know, right? I just feel like, I don't know. But this guy should know this. This isn't that hard. For the Jew, what does a Jew have to do to inherit eternal life? Follow the law and don't sin. That was it. That was it. And what we're going to find is Jesus says, why do you call me good? And then he says, uh, follow the commandments. And he goes through all the commandments. And the guy says, I followed all those since, my, since I was young. I mean, who of us can say that? I followed all of that since I was young. He says this, right? So why, what's going on here? That, that this was a guy who was virtuous. He was faithful. He was following the law. He wasn't sinning. And still there's something that's just gnawing inside of him that causes him to run up and says, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Perhaps there's something just inside, deep inside that recognizes it has to be more than just being good. It has to be something more than just following the rules or being orthodox or, or praying the right way. There has to be something more than that. And he just runs up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, what do I need to do? And, and honestly, you guys, I think this is one of the saddest scriptures in the Bible. Jesus tells him, you followed the laws, I've done all that, check, check, check. And then he says, okay, you're lacking in just one thing. I mean, if the Lord were to look at me and say, you know, Dave, you're just lacking one thing. It's like, only one thing? Seriously, I know people like, you're lacking in a dozen things, right? <laughs> you're lacking in one thing. It's this guy's like, cha-ching. Right? Go sell what you have and give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. And at that, his face fell, and he went away sad for he had many possessions. I mean, that's a, that's a sad story. I mean, something's gnawing in this guy's heart. He knows that there's something more. He goes to Jesus because he wants the answer. And Jesus says, you just have to do one thing. And that one thing is, is your possessions are keeping you away from me. And if you want to inherit eternal life, if you want to go to heaven, ultimately what you need to do is you need to follow me. And this stuff is stopping you from doing that. So the step you need to take is to get rid of it. Get rid of whatever it is that's between me and you. Get rid of whatever it is that's keeping me away from you. Get whatever we make more important than him. And as a side note, Recently in the culture, I've heard people say that Jesus wouldn't ask hard things, right? right? Where, where do we hear that? Why, why do we think that? I mean, when Jesus doesn't say, okay, here's what you need to do. Sell everything and follow me. It's like, ah, I can't do that. Okay, well then, how about this? It, like, it doesn't become this bargain. It's like, sell two-thirds of it, keep like half of it for yourself. Follow me if you feel like. But if you find another offer out there, no, no. And he doesn't. And he walks away sad. I mean, that, that just... If you think about that, it just breaks your heart. He just walks away sad because he can't do that. There's another story in the scripture, and this one comes from the 14th chapter of Matthew. Again, another somebody else being asked to take a step. Jesus has just multiplied the loaves. He's fed the 5,000. 
And he's, the scripture is uh, Matthew 14, verse 22. The scripture says, Then he made the disciples get into the boat and proceed him to the other side while he was dismissing the crowd. I just like that first off. He made them get in the boat. I just love that image. It's like, get in the boat. I don't want to get, get in the boat now, all right? <laughs> Jesus makes them get in the boat. Have you ever been in the Sea of Galilee? Anyone? Sea of Galilee? Let's go to do this in the Sea of Galilee next time. And we know the story, right? That the storm comes up. I had an experience recently when I was just went to Jerusalem to the Holy Land in January, and we were on the Sea of Galilee, which is honestly, I've traveled a lot. People ask me, what's your favorite place in the world? Watching the sea, the sun rise above the Sea of Galilee is one of the most amazing things, right? So we're out on the Sea of Galilee. We're just putting her along in our little boat, uh, and the engine stops. And they're trying to start it, and it won't start it. It won't start. The name of our boat was, and I thought this was beautiful for me, the name of our boat was King David. I appreciated that, except the engine couldn't start. And literally, this sounds like I'm making it up, but I'm not. There's a storm that's coming, right? So we're literally on the edge of the sea, on the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Engine won't start. The storm is coming. It's, so we all start to pray. It's like, Lord, you just, oh, like, you need to take care. And literally, I kid you not, out of nowhere, another boat comes. We, we pray, like, five seconds, another boat comes next to us. What is the name of that boat? Noah. Fantastic, right? I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up, right? And it's a bunch of Protestants from Houston singing, <laughs> singing Days of Elijah, right? So, oh my gosh. Right? So they tow us back in. It's amazing what was wrong, right? We were out of gas, so. So meanwhile, I, I digress. Meanwhile, so the storm comes. They ran out of gas. The storm comes in the fourth watch of the night. Jesus is coming towards them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear at once. Jesus spoke to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. I love Peter, right? I just love Peter. Peter says to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out on the water. And the Lord said to him, come. And Peter thought, I knew I shouldn't have said that, right? <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have said that. It's like, this is what I love about Peter. He, he, Peter's like one of those, he shoots and then he asks questions, okay? <laughs> In their midst of their fear, Jesus says, take courage, it is I. Lord, if it really is you, command me to come. He says, Come. Peter got out of the boat, he took a step, and he began to walk on water towards Jesus. And we know the story. Do you know what it's like to walk on water? God wants you to know. God wants you to be in a position where if he doesn't come through, you're going to sink. And you guys, there's nothing like that. To be at that place where you are so utterly dependent on God that if he doesn't do something, you're literally going to sink. And this is, this is what happens on Peter. I mean, he, he makes that, that next step. And he begins to, I mean, those first couple of steps must have been so cool. And it's probably why he sank, because Peter's like, wait a minute. And he's like to the other guys, ha, ah. <laughs> And I love that. Right, again, I love Peter. And he immediately begins to sink. And he yells, save me. And the scripture says, immediately, immediately, Jesus reaches out. And he saves him. The reason I chose these two stories is because they represent two different people. Peter had already left everything. Like Peter, if we go back in the scriptures, Peter had already had this encounter. And Jesus said it differently, but he in essence says, Peter, follow me. And he follows Jesus. He leaves everything and he follows. Now, the rich young man wasn't able to do that. He wasn't able to do that. The rich young man's step that he needed to take was to be able to leave everything and to follow him. Peter had always done, already done that. So then the Lord asked Peter to make a step, to get out of the boat. 
And I picked these two stories because they may represent us and the people that are gathered here today. I want to be clear. Jesus is not asking you to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. What he is asking is whatever it is that keeps you away from him to get rid of that. And the question is, do you know what that is? That's something I think we need to be able to figure out. What, what is that thing that doesn't allow us to make that step? And for the rich young man, it was a very simple step. It was just that first step, that first choice, the first decision to follow Jesus. But Peter's was different. Peter had already made that choice. Peter wasn't being asked to sell everything because he'd already done that. Peter was being asked to walk on water. Peter was being asked to get out of the boat, that, that place that in his mind was safe and everything was comfortable. And, and Jesus is saying, are you willing to get and take a step out of that? This journey that the Lord is inviting us to, and I don't know, I don't know where you are. I know some of you, you're here and this is new and you've never quite done anything like this. You've never seen anything. You may be the, the young man that just needs to make one step and says that I'm going to follow Jesus. And there are other people here that the Lord is asking you to walk on water. But what I know that he's asking you to do something. And what I would hope is through the evening and the weekend, we're able to try to figure out what that is. So there are a couple of things that I think that are helpful for us. It is what is it that allows us to make these steps? And the first one is, is the ability that each one, or the invitation that each one of us is, give, is being given to put Jesus in the center of our life. And, and for some of you, you're like Peter, you've done that a hundred times. And for others, you, honestly, you don't even know quite what that means. But it means, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. It means, Jesus, I'm going to put you in the center of my life. Not myself, not my spouse, not my job, not my work, not my family, not my reputation, but I'm going to follow you. I'm going to put you in the center of my life. For some, it's a simple. You've done it a million times. For others, you're just not sure what that means. The other is the ability to be able to figure out what it is that's keeping you away from him. And that's what I want to take a look at, a couple of the things that, that I think the Lord would want us to know. This invitation that each one of us has to be able to make this step with him. First off, God is with us. Say that after me. God is with us. God is with us. For St. Francis, the greatest feast is Christmas. Not Easter. It's Christmas. Emmanuel. God is with us. The Feast of the Visitation the other day, we had the reading from Zephaniah, and I love it. It's uh, Zephaniah, he says, shout for joy, rejoice, O Holy One. Why? For God is in your midst. That the fear that we have about whatever it is that the Lord is asking us to, where he's inviting us to, whether it's to step out of the boat, whether it's to be able to just make that first step and say that I'm going to follow you, I'm going to get rid of everything that keeps me away from you. The fundamental thing that we must keep in mind, guys, is that God is with us. And I think it's something that we forgot or maybe didn't even know. My suspicion is if we really understood that God is with us, that he dwells in us. One of the things that I had hoped for, I, this sounded weird, I was going to say what I hoped for during COVID, what I hoped for was that it would end, Right. But this invitation that I think the Lord was offering us to be able to find the Lord within. You know, so much of our faith, is, is, it's about going. It's, and this, I'm glad you're here. It's about going to a conference. It's about going to a prayer meeting. It's about going to a pilgrimage. It's about going to mass. But our faith is a God who comes to us. God is with us. I think he wants to stir in our hearts that deeper understanding that God is with you, that you are not alone, that the world is great. Because of the incarnation, the world is graced. Amen? Do me a favor. Just close your eyes for a second. Take a deep breath. God is with us. 
Amen? God is faithful. I think one of the concerns we have is that we're concerned about if I make this step, what's going to happen? I mean, I remember the first literally stepping out of that plane. It's like, this better work, right? But the thing with the Lord is I know and you know that you can make this step because God is faithful that he is present, that no matter what happens, no matter where, God is loving you, that there's not something you can do that can cause God to love you more, there's not something you can do that could cause, cause God to love you less, that God is faithful. If he's going to invite you to make a step, if he's going to invite you to leave something behind, he will care for you. God is faithful. That he is always forgiving. No matter what you've done, and the reality is no matter what you do, if we come before the Lord and seek him, that he is merciful, that he is forgiving, that he is kind. God is with us. God is faithful. And third, God is good. I think one of the greatest lies of the evil one is that he doesn't want us to believe that God is good. And he evidenced that by bad things happen. The evil one causes us to look at the difficulties of our life and the struggles of our life and pain and suffering and difficulty and divorce and dementia and cancer and bankruptcy and fill in the blank, infertility, whatever, fill in the blank. See, God isn't good. Because this happened. And what the evil one wants us to do is to take our eyes off of this. That, that the goodness of God is, again, for St. Francis, revealed here. It's, it's remarkable that we have a God who is with us, but that this same God who is with us would take upon himself the sufferings and the brokenness and the sinfulness of humanity and transform that. And remind us that he is good. Remind us that, that in the midst of our brokenness, that he is, he is good. Because I think it's difficult for us to be able to make this step of faith if we don't believe that God is trustworthy, if we don't believe that he's faithful, if we don't believe that he's there, if we don't believe that he is good. But if we can believe those things, this invitation that the Lord gives us to be able to step in faith, to be able to step out and trust him, And that's what I want to do. Amen? Amen. Do me a favor. Just close your eyes for a second. And open your hands on your lap. Really, really simple thing of just being able to receive. Repeat after me. Lord Jesus... Come with your Holy Spirit. The scriptures provided us two images. The image of the rich young man who Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, leave behind everything that keeps you from me. Make that step and follow me. And Peter, inviting him to get out of the boat. Just for a moment, which of those people do you most resonate with? Kind of having everything together, but but just something is gnawing in your heart that says that there has to be something more. Even though I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, they're just... There has to be something more. The rich young man that approaches and is excited and and then walks away sad. Or, Or Peter in the midst of the storm and a difficulty and a struggle that says, Lord, if it's you, just tell me and I'll do whatever. And and stepping out of that boat. Come, Holy Spirit.
Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit would come in light. Again, repeat after me, Lord Jesus, come with your Holy Spirit and be light, be fire. Help me to see. What's the thing that Jesus is asking you to give him? For the rich young man, it was his possessions. What is it for you? Is it your past? The shame? What is it that the Lord is asking you to lay down before him? Just be able to lay it down before him. For some, it's fear. For some, it feels like you're not worthy. What is it that he's asking you to give him? Anything that keeps you away from him.